were the only political party that has got a building owned to its name in the whole of South Africa in less than 10 years. Thank you. Um, let me take some... Okay. Uh, we'll start at the back and then come to Lengue. No, I want to spread a bit to the left. Yeah, yeah. We'll come back to the left. <laughs> you must come to the left. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Please say your name. Uh, Hello, my name is Modise Maite. I'm from Freestadt. Sure. Um, I would like to first thank for the for thank, thank everyone for the opportunity to talk. I want to know ne, this is in relation to uh, graduates versus education versus employment in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There are students, mainly from Pumalanga and Free State, who are sent overseas by their provincial provincial governments to study courses like medicine and many other courses. Mm -hmm. And when they come here to South Africa, they are exposed now to this high level testing. What can the leadership of the EFF do to make sure that these citizens of ours come back home and serve the people of South Africa without being involved in this high level of testing, whereas they were sent by our own professional governments. Thank you. Thank you. I can take the, the gentleman in the middle. Your name, please. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Ndipio Matigiza. Uh, President, I think my question is around the seven pillars of yep. the manifesto. When we, when the EFF takes over, it, it has five years to implement the seven pillars. Now my question to you is that five years is sufficient because one, we'll have to do a bit of cleaning up to make sure that um, those pillars are achieved. And second of all, if we cleaning up, not everyone will understand the process of cleaning up in terms of removing what you deem not fit to achieve the seven pillars. Now my question is, are you, is the EFF doing enough to educate you know, people in the villages or the youth to understand what it's going to take to flip around the state of the country in achieving the seven pillars? Thank you. Okay, thank you. How do you manage a crisis of expectations? I have a lady in front here. Money right in front, my colleague uh, Lengiwe, Dr. Nglovo. Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, CIC, for your insightful um, comments that you've been um, sharing with us. My question is um, on one of the most controversial issues that um, we've dealt with beginning of this year. And I'm happy that today it's um, in your own voice, through your own lens, uh, outside of social media and what uh, social media um, has said. So this is related um, to the matter of MP Naledi Chira and uh, missing the budget speech and how that sparked a debate on social media with um, many of us as women asking what is the position of women within those spaces if you have to apologize for having a sick baby at home and then uh, rushing to attend that emergency. So my question to you would be, I've read uh, many of your manifestos from local governments to, um, to national and uh, I've known the stance of the political party in terms of gender transformation and gender equity. But following that event, I would like to know um, what has been done about that. I know some of these things are internal political issues. Did Naledi ended up paying the gazebos as she was fined? And um, what are the implications of that in terms of uh, the, 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 the position of women and women being, um, you know, uh, in most cases relegated to reproductive labor and having to carry uh, you know, some of these important duties, especially in parliament. And also, um, how is the EFF as a political party actively thinking about gender transformation beyond the party? And if you are to position yourself as the next uh, ruling party, what 
how long should we expect to see um, a woman president in this country? Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. I, I, I have to leave you this one. Here, this is a young student. Yeah. <laughs> Lena. <laughs> um, greetings to all in attendance. Your, your name, please. Sandra. Oh, my name is Bugisa, but um, I'd like to greet this, the CIC first and also the incoming president of the Republic. I have two questions. Um, my first question is with regards to the role of local government in the land reform project, right? So what does the EFF say with regards to balancing development for, future, for the future, right, through either industrialization or um, building of the finance sector um, and balancing it with like social reform to encourage economic transformation? That's the first one. And then secondly, how do we build good governance, um, not to just have ideals like transparency as tick box exercises, how do we build a system that is proactive in ensuring that leaders are accountable to the citizens of this country? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we should come back to you. Yeah. And in some, actually, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a question about I, is, is the EFF really a party of government? <laughs> no, well, um, I think that the, the, this question on uh, um, uh, the students who study overseas and then having to come back and be subjected to a further training and all kinds of uh, treatment. It is actually an issue that emanates from people who are not professional in their approach of government. So if you are a, a politician and you happen to be a minister, you must know that you are now a professional politician. You're not just a politician. You are a professional politician. So you ought to have some level of professionalism in, in, in that. When I send people to go and study medicine, I should send them to a country where I know their standards meet my standard. The further training is because you don't have confidence in that other training. How do you take kids to Cuba? They go there for seven years, and I think Cuba is even worse because the first two years, you must learn Spanish and then uh, uh, learn uh, Lenin and Marx because they don't just want a doctor, they want a revolutionary doctor. So how do you send them there? And then they come back here, and then you say this must be a further training. I have no problem, send them there. When they are about to complete there, bring them back. So they do their practicals here. When they graduate, they graduate straight into employment, not into further training. So uh, we, we don't want this thing of Ace Mahashule Premier wakes up every morning, he met some pre prime minister of what, what, or president of what. And this is not bring uh, 30 students. What are the standards there? What are the issues? No idea. In the EFF Founding Manifesto, we say, we are going to give 10,000 scholarships for students to go and study overseas uh, on the field that we don't have the necessary skills here in South Africa. But they can only be sent to the countries where we know that they will come back with the necessary skill. Mm -hmm. So if you send a child to go and do film production in China, and then he comes back here, you must know he's the best. Mm -hmm. They're the best in film. Don't be misled by Hollywood nonsense of imperialism. Mm -hmm. So he must go learn a film production in China and then still come here and learn uh, further training after coming from China from the best on film production. What are you saying? So whatever you do, do not play with the future of our children. Uh, because they too, they plan their life. They know I'm going for this much. When I'm back, this is how I'm moving forward. Um, 
We have to, and it's not a 21st birthday, we have to in inculcate the political education and culture amongst our people to have an appreciation of what we stand for. And that's why in the EFF, we're not in a hurry for these things. Because we first want to make sure that we ground our people on political understanding and policies of the EFF. Because with our policies, if we take over tomorrow, the DA has got a potential of mobilizing our own people against us after they voted for us, if they are not political. So you ought to tell them that when we expropriate land without compensation, we're going to be attacked by the West, we're going to be attacked by America, all types of things are going to happen. You need to be mentally ready because we must look for alternative markets. This thing that America must be a permanent big brother at some point must come to an end. And the big markets are emerging uh, in the world, and that's where we should be uh, leaning to. Mm. Uh, I really don't know what is an issue about uh, Naledi Chiro, because, uh, doctor, you, you, if you work here in the School of Governance, and it happens that uh, you are taking a child to hospital tomorrow morning, because you can't foresee that your child is going to be sick. So you wake up, the child is sick, you rush the child to a hospital. There is no way, at the level of your professionalism, you cannot call your supervisors and say, hey man, I'm unable to come because I've got an emergency. You don't have to be a woman. Being a woman does not mean be unprofessional and hide behind being a woman. Myself, I can miss my work because my child is sick. Actually, if I'm at work and I'm told my child is sick, I will leave work. But I won't live in a disrespectful way because I'm a man. No, I'm, I'm under a certain leadership. I have to say to them, comrades, I'm not going to make it uh, because I'm rushing home, my child is sick. You don't do that, right? You don't do that. You don't do that even after you come back to work. You don't do it. You don't do it. You, you come back to work. You don't tell anyone anything. The day we say to you, hey, uh, where were you on such, such a day because you had this role to play and you didn't play it? That's what happens in the EFF. We write you a letter. Please explain where you were on such, such a day. She never said that to us. There was someone who gave explanation who was not there, and the explanation got accepted. She doesn't say that to us. She says all manner of things. We get to know about a child, a sick child, on the social media. I told you, you go to parliament, you become a minister, you become a professional politician. That kind of attitude will not accept in the EFF. Not from a man, not from a woman. Because there is no man, there is no woman in the EFF. It's the leadership. And the leadership must behave in a manner befitting of leadership. We are the first ones ourselves to be represented in all spheres of government, 50%. There's no party in South Africa today as a matter of principle and policy that says we, we must have 50% everywhere you go. In the EFF, we want eight party agents. Four of them must be women. In the EFF, one, two delegates, one of them must be women. If there are two women, there is no problem. In the EFF, we have the... Uh, 50-50 in the top six, with a national chairperson of the EFF being a woman. Now, when this decision is being made about my lady, because of social media and all of that, all of you see me in taking that decision. I was not even involved. The we party in parliament is the national chairperson woman. 
Tengwe Mkalipi woman TG umpile mautwe woman Mama Rineilo Mashabela woman Mbuse ni nduzi man Oh really Mama tu from the NCOP woman So that decision as to Hey, where were you, men? Why didn't you do this in Parliament and all of that? I'm not involved. Then their boss, of course, is the deputy president as a chief whip. But the whipper is the one that is responsible for us. Where are we? Did we attend committees? Did you do this? Did you do that? So the decision was taken. I saw a response on, uh, on, the, on the social media. I went to check. They said, no, we inquired as to... What is the explanation? The explanation was not sufficient, and we're like, we're not going to accept this, because this organization from its foundation is built on discipline. Yeah, you are going to be disciplined whether you like it or not. You don't want to be disciplined. There is a party next door with yellow colors. You can go there. <laughs> and that's where you do as you wish. Ours is democratic centralism because democracy that is not managed can be anarchy. <laughs> rights, this rights, that. Look at our rights now. Prisoners get free uniform. Learners don't have free uniform. The uniform she's wearing, the mother bought it. She doesn't get it for free. She wants a free uniform, she must go to prison. <laughs> How do you give prisoners free uniform and you don't give learners free uniform? You give prisoners flushing toilet. Students, learners in the Eastern Cape don't have flushing toilets. Prisoners have. You give prisoners breakfast, lunch, supper. Our people in Alexander, if they have a meal that day, they are very fortunate. But prisoners have got a guaranteed meal. Prisoners have got running water. Prisoners have got electricity. I heard you saying ministers are buying themselves generators to fight load shedding. Prisoners have got generators. They don't know load shedding. So prisoners live in a much more better position than an ordinary person who's not in prison in South Africa because majority of our people are living in extreme poverty. Almost 18.6 million people in South Africa live in extreme poverty. So when you use lower and middle income to define poverty, you have 34 million people in 2023 alone in South Africa who lived in poverty in South Africa. So, and that is 41% of your population, by the way. So we cannot allow these things to happen. We have to reprioritize uh, our priorities. So women, gender equality, um, um, there must not be a female president. There must be a president, whether female or not. No one must deny people that they can't be president because they are women. No, no one can do that. Women must stand, accept the nominations wherever they are nominated for positions of president, and both men and women must support them on the basis of their qualities. No one must say, we are not, go not going to be governed here by a woman. There is no such a policy uh, uh, in the EFF. So, a uh, woman president is inevitable. We almost had, by the way, uh, Pumzil. President Mbeji, when he was fighting with Zuma, went to Bloemfontein and said, we need a female president before Pulukwan. And then he goes to Pulukwan. He forgets it's not a female. He stands himself. <laughs> After he said he wants a female President, and no one called him a flip flopper, by the way. He's an intellectual, he's a thinker. <laughs> right? President Mbeki, the way he was so powerful, we feared that guy. When that guy walked into the corridors of Corsas, he knows 
We used to run. Like this, you know a president you must run to. We run opposite direction, hiding. That if he asks you some difficult question, how are you going to navigate it? <laughs> Had President Mbeki said, Pumzile must be president of South Africa, he was going to write about it. If you don't hear him, he was going to write every Friday about it <laughs> until you hear him. He was going to argue it intellectually and politically as to why. And with the power he had, we're going to accept it. President Mbeki was the most influential person, even when we went to remove him in Pulukwane, in the Youth League. No one removed President Mbeki out of hatred. No one removed President Mbeki because we said he doesn't have capacity. We refused a third term. And that was so scary to us because of his proximity with President Mugabe. And we're like, this guy who has a two-third says, I'm going to be president of the ANC. The constitution of the country doesn't allow two, it doesn't allow third term. But the guy's got two-third. Two he leaves Pulukwan State to Cape Town. He tells them, amend this thing. And allow uh, limitless presidents. What are you going to do? We were against the third term. And no one capable was ready to challenge him. That's how much he was feared. Then Zuma said, I've got nothing to lose. <laughs> That's how he became president. Because we, we had no one. Not Trevor Manuel could stand. Pumzile could not stand. And look at what President Big did to Pumzile now. She went to join COPE. And then she came back to the ANC. And you must know in the ANC, once you go outside, when you go back, they say, Pumzile, but which one? That one of COPE. <laughs> so it's like when you leave the EFF, when you go back to the ANC, bottom we say, but which one? The one of EFF. You are still called by your previous poll. So she will never, I can tell you now, she will never emerge in the ANC as a female president. So I'm answering the question, what about a female president? We almost, and South Africa was not going to reject that. The ANC was not going to reject that. By, I mean, here's a man who's popular. They say they remove him as deputy president. They put Pumzile as deputy president. No one fought that decision. That's how much we've always been ready for quality leadership. Uh, local government, uh, in the EFF manifesto, especially in 2021, we advocate for local government that will make land available to those who want to industrialize and beneficiate uh, in those local municipalities. If we want to uh, activate local economy, the municipality must go extra mile and give certain incentives to those who are prepared to leave the cities, the big cities, and come and invest there. And then we also are advocating for local procurements of goods and services. That you cannot have a prison that buys tomato from Johannesburg, and that prison is in Venda, the most arable land in Venda. ZZ2 is one of the biggest producers of tomato in South Africa. The prison doesn't buy the tomato from ZZ2. It waits for it to get into a truck. It must make a turn in Joburg and then come back to Venda. What is that? So when you buy, you encourage people to work the land because they know the customer is already here. Services must be procured uh, from local. There is no way you can say whatever you want to say. And some of you say Zimbabweans are taking your jobs, Nigerians are taking your jobs. It's not true. The economy is stuck. The economy is stuck because manufacturing has collapsed. Manufacturing used to be one of the biggest contributors to our GDP at 24%, like in 1989. Today, manufacturing accounts for 14%. Our economy has been financialized. Financial institutions 
are now the biggest contributors of the GDP at 14%, I mean at 24%, and manufacturing at 14%. But finance used to be at 14 so they swapped places. And the swapping of places by manufacturing and finance, it means South Africa is engaged in deindustrialization. And it favors more the dominance of the financial market into our economy. And the financial market does not invest in the long term. It only works with short term. So what they do, they handle what we call hot money. So they put their money here. It doesn't make sense. They want something that is easily movable. That's why they will not finance anything that is industrial because industrial is long term. Textile industry has collapsed. In the last 30 years, we lost almost 150,000 jobs in textile industry. Um, uh, today, textile industry employs only 80,000 80, people. Where I grew up, there used to be a textile factory. Every time I'm playing outside my grandmother's yard, people used to come walking in their numbers like this. Because in the morning, we don't see them who are sleeping. So I've always been curious, where these people come from? But no one is fair, make a most called discreet. What does it do? It makes clothes. Used to employ a lot. It has collapsed. Local, the buildings are there. They're still standing there. Let local government say whoever is going to do utilize this factory for whatever purpose and you employ so much people, we will discount your water, we'll discount your electricity, or we'll do this. Give them something to come back into our townships. So that's what we actually are advocating for. There is no way we're going to get it right without industrialization and beneficiation in South Africa. Financialization of our economy is the downfall of this. And finance, I mean, how many banks in South Africa? 30 banks. All of them are white-owned. Five dominant banks, all of them white-owned. They decide where they put their money. Guess what? They never borrow or lend money to anyone who wants to industrialize. They're looking at you must pay us now. Because if this Julius Malema takes over and we don't like him, we can't carry an industry and run with it. But the money we can press, transfer, and off we go. They don't want to invest in South Africa because of racism and the, the, the disregard of the leadership, of African leadership. They don't trust us with their money. That's why they put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a liquidity so that any time they can disappear. Uh, with it. One of the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF is an accountable and free society where people don't live in the fear of state agencies. So leaders, when you want to hold them accountable, they send walks to you. Or when you are like Bratemba here in the school of governance, they send whoever they want to send or no, you must go for vetting. And not just, you are just a professor, Tijibari, you must, you must vet you. And then the highest form of vetting, and then we must also do a lie detect on you. Because you are going to reach out, you are so scared, like, what is this? You reach out to a minister, minister says, don't worry, we'll work on it. Then they've got the control of you from that time. No one must be captured in that sense by the state. People must be free to express themselves and hold the leadership accountable. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We are going to, with, with the indulgence of the audience, spill over slightly. Uh, We've had the president speaking for <laughs> an hour. No, you can tell last five and then uh, one hour we forty-five say he's minutes now. But huh? um, you have five minutes. Yeah, I mean, not five minutes. Five hands. You can take five hands. <laughs> okay. The last one. Yeah. So let's take. A, we'll take a last. Round and it of must questions. be gender balanced. Yes, we'll take a last. <laughs> a last round of questions. I think we've done very well with gender so far. <laughs> uh, but before, before I come to the audience, and please be as concise as possible, 
You raised the issue of financialization, the problem of the industrialization, the um, importance which speculation uh, has assumed now in economies around the world. And this is not just something which is common to South Africa. It's a Pan-African challenge. And uh, maybe it would be interesting for this audience to hear what would be the kennel of the EFF's Africa renewal policy and strategy uh, in as concise oh, manner yes. as possible. You know, uh, the EFF advocates for one Africa where movements of goods and individuals is free and we can trade with one another. One of the things we need to do is to revive the African economy to avoid this pettiness that we are being subjected to. Because in the absence of industrialized continent, our brothers and sisters are always going to look for greener pastures. That's how, by the way, we arrived here. So no one here seated here who can claim that their ancestors didn't arrive here looking for greener pastures. They were moving uh, from the north to the south. And their survival was what we used to call hunter-gatherer fisher. Mm -hmm. So it's hunting, it's gathering, and it's fishing. Mm -hmm. So they always look for a green land. And next to it, there must be water because there must be fishing. But not only for fishing, this livestock that we go around with, it must have a river where it can uh, drink water from beautiful land where it can graze. It can never be with our generation that advocates for decoloniality. Then say Africans are not free to move in their own continent. Show me in any policy of the EFF where I say we, Africans must not have documents. The reason why you are not catching these Mozambicans who are stealing cars is because of that gate. But once we all belong to one continent, everybody will be having a passport of that continent. Everyone. Which means you can be located somewhere. We'll find you. Everybody. So what is your problem? And there is some level of madness proof where we've got a gate called a border. It's a gate. But there's no fence. <laughs> Just imagine a person going to his house. He has installed a gate. And there's no fence. He opens that gate and close it. And not just close it, lock it. <laughs> there's no fence. No, anyone who says there is a fence is lying. There's no fence. These are artificial. So we need to industrialize. We need to electrify the whole continent. We can get ESCOM to electrify the whole continent. And the whole continent pays us for electricity. Because... ESCOM has got the necessary capacity to can electrify the whole continent. Don't tell me about these man-made problems, which can be resolved by capacity only. So you have to now use the minerals of the continent in the continent. So if we are good with giving them electricity, another country will be good at giving us this. And then imagine us alone prof with Zimbabwe. We account for not less than 85% of platinum. the platinum. platinum. Then the next per biggest person, I mean country, who uh, has platinum is Russia. Mm. So if we bring Russia, then we are now at 90% owners of platinum. Why can't we decide the price of platinum? Because we are the owners of platinum. It can only be done if the continent is together. DRC. DRC is in crisis today, and it will never be resolved because of its minerals. Those people destabilize that country so that they can take the minerals in that country without paying taxes because there is no proper government. I mean, people go into a forest and build a landing strip. There's no one who controls the airspace there. They just go in, zoom collect whatever they collect and leave. We, we, they, when we say one continent, all of that, 
Those are the people who get threatened that, no, 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 what's going to happen to this thing that we're doing? So as students of uh, uh, decoloniality, you should know how the borders came about. And you can't say you don't support apartheid and colonialism and support the things that made us to be divided the way we are. So they always say, no, I can't vote for EFF. Why? Because of the borders. Then I normally ask them the question, who made the borders? Is the EFF now that has made the, the borders? It's not EFF that made the borders. Why are you accusing us of the things we have not? We don't, there were no borders. And all of us must advocate for that. This thing that when people are, are hungry, they are going to leave their countries and come here is not true. I come from a poverty-stricken province of Limpopo. There is no fence. My people stay there. <laughs> they never came here to come and cause trouble for you. Yet there is no fence, and yet they are poor. They don't have water and electricity in almost... Just from Amman Skral going down, Amman Skral people never moved from Amman Skral to come to Santin because there is water there. <laughs> so what is... The, this is unscientific... This is based on pure hatred of self. It's a pure self-hatred which has got no basis. Uh, we can argue it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So this is going to be a bit difficult. Um, I'll take the lady. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much, sir. This is a question for Mr. Malema. What would a good May 31st look, for you, look like for you? That's the results day. Do you think you'll be the official opposition? It looks like in Gauteng, at least, an ANC-EFF coalition is a done deal. Do you agree <laughs> with that? And what are the terms of such, if so? OK, thank you. You didn't tell us your name, or I missed it. You didn't tell us your name, or did I miss it? Uh, my name is Feriel Hafaji. I'm a journalist with the Daily Maverick. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Is there a secret done deal? May I take? Yes. <laughs> the gentleman at the far end. <laughs> when I wanted to call you, you were looking away busily. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. My name is Masil from the SABC News. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, the question is about, you've answered part of it, is on exploration of land without compensation. Uh, that issue has been out of parliament since 2021, when the EFF voted uh, against it for the reasons that you've already given. So the question is, when is it going back to parliament? Because it cannot just be part of your... Your, of your manifesto forever and ever. Um, and another question is on question. The, the chairperson of that committee mm. was Matule Mutsekha. And recently, um, Mutsekha was seen in one of the podcasts saying the people in parliament are fighting for crumbs instead of distributing land to the, to the people. What's your reaction on that one? Uh, another okay, one is on no, the... No, 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 please, 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 please. Thank you very much. Could I take the gentleman at the far end? I know there are many questions, but... At the far end. Yeah, the gentleman in the T-shirt. Um, good evening, colleagues, and thank you very much. Um, Mr. Malema, my name is Roy Kamwanga. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Political Study here at WIT. Um, I'm also Congolese, and that is the context of my question today. You are a true pan-Africanist. You have continuously showed solidarity to the African continent. So here's my question based on that context. What is your position on the SADC mission in the DRC, taking into account the resources constraint that South Africa is going through, and the desperate conditions of the Congolese people in the eastern parts of the DRC, seeing that our government has failed to control the situation for so many years. And lastly, what is yours and the EFF's position on the DRC's call to sanction Rwanda 
and how will the diplomatic tensions between these two countries position South, South Africa and the EFF? Thank you. Okay, merci beaucoup. Uh, there's a lady out here. I have to do gender balance. Yes. Uh, as directed. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Um, I know the ANC said uh, they will be <coughs> providing 2.5 million jobs by 2029, and actually they said 4.8 and they said 2 million. But uh, the EFF didn't quite specify, and I think they have a as well, uh, and they provided probably the most comprehensive um, action plan around jobs. So I just wanted to find out, uh, in terms of these figures, uh, how feasible or attainable are they? And in terms of grants, um, uh, the EFF uh, promised to provide uh, grants for unpaid uh, graduates. And I just wanted to find out where would the funds be coming from and who made the system. Okay, thank you. Good question on the economy. In front here, please. for the opportunity. Um, so. Commander-in-Chief and President Julia Silo Malema, the students of Vets University um, have voted for the EFF Student Command to be in governance. So you are at home under the president of <laughs> Bugisa Bonisa. <laughs> so, um, president, the, the, the students always go to the streets uh, year in, year out, asking for free education, and we have a minister who is um, Minister played in Zimande, that in every term where he comes into office, we see the worst things happening. The recent one being Tenet, where he's um, appointed his own service providers so that they can share money between NFSAS and fund the election campaign of uh, SACP under the ANC. Please, uh, President, after the day of victory on the 30th of May, save us from that man, which is number one. <laughs> but, um, the EFF Student Command, um, here on campus, we have three voting districts. We already have 41,000 plus students that have agreed to say that they are ready to be, you know, um, led by the EFF, which is the same thing that happens in all different campuses around the country. But you had mentioned when you started that there is a point of fatigue before there is adrenaline that takes over and makes sure that people continue to work. Uh, for the victory of the EFF student, uh, EFF um, in, the, in the provincial and national elections. So any words of encouragement, President, we are more than energetic, but I know that many young people would appreciate hearing from you directly um, a, a, a clarion call. Uh, I might be jumping the car, and a clarion call, <laughs> but to say that uh, there's 34 days that are remaining to just give us that vibranium so that we can go and, 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 and even get to, um, you know, be in governance. Okay, thank you. Also, President, before no, you leave, uh, you. can I please get a picture to send to <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have plenty of photo opportunity. <laughs> but, but not when you load him with so many questions at the same time. <laughs> I'll take one more. Uh, to make it uh, six no, it questions for this round. Um, yes, let me take the gentleman there. For those who may not get to ask questions, when you take the photos outside, you can. <laughs> yes. from the physical currency because we see that the world is moving towards a digital currency. And if so, I want to understand what are the policies that the EFF wish to implement to protect that currency that will belong to the Africans 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, when you run a marathon, you always want to become number one. Um, and, and that's what we are actually targeting. Uh, and if we fail, we must be number two. Um, because number three will not be achievement. That's what we are. So it can be. And declining is not an option uh, for anyone involved in the EFF uh, work. You know, coalitions in Gauteng, uh, they might look easy. They are not easy, uh, for real. We, we're battling it out. But the good thing is that, which will happen in the country, the good thing is that the people who lead the ANC now are the people that we led with in the Youth League. Um, and somehow, we are able to reach out to each other and uh, make the ANC to be loyal to the decisions we have taken because the ANC is the most unreliable partner you want to rela relate with. I mean, they just cheated now with Action SA in Guruling, these cheaters, and removed our mayor. So then we had to go back. They no wait, man. Let's work together and all of that. Why? They said, OK, we're going to work with you. We want finance. And then we take the mayor. I mean, you take the mayor. Uh, we said, no. You can't get finance. You can't entrust the resources of the people with you. We're going to get finance. You take the mayor. There is no crooked invoice that is going to pass there of crooked ANC arrangement. We are there to look after the resources of our people. Every cent that is going to leave the coffers of that municipality will go into uh, what is intended for. Any other thing is not going to happen. So. Uh, we, we, we are heading there. It's inevitable for the country to be in a coalition. Why? The local government tells you what's going to happen nationally because it starts grassroots upwards. And the ANC, when it loses, it has got no history of recovering. Mm. Once they lose, they lose forever. They don't come back. They don't say, you... Hey, let's go back to the drawing board. No, they lose. Why, why? Like, they lost Western Cape. And then they never recovered it. They lost Tony. They lost Joe Beck. In 2016, they never recovered it. If anything, they became worse in 2021 after 2016. The ANC declined under Ramaphosa to 57% from 63 when Ramaphosa was the guy, man, yeah, you will think this guy, everyone was like, no, we're going forward. We've got a new president. We had a horrible president. Let's go. This is the guy. Even with his charm and the media around him and the money, he could not increase the ANC votes at that time. When he was still hot, can you imagine now what is he going to do when he could, what he couldn't do? in 2019. Reduce the ANC votes to 57%. Mbalula says, because we used to be friends in our in, uh, uh, informal gatherings, he says, hey, my guy, Colonel, this guy declined your votes. He says, hey, hey, if it was not this guy, it would have been worse. <laughs> so that 57, we thank this guy for it because had it been Nkosa, Zana, or anyone, we're, we're out. So you can criticize him any you want. He saved us with that 57%. At that time, he, he didn't increase their votes. 2021, local government elections, he has put them at 40-something percent now. In local government elections, nationally, in 2021, Ramaphosa. So what has changed between 2021 and now which can make Ramaphosa to have a magic? And listen to him when he does door to door. The things he says to people. 
a young girl says, I'm looking for a job and all of that, keep searching. <laughs> a man says, eh, no, buy me a fridge. He says, where were you working? I was working at what? I'll go to them and ask them to buy you a fridge. But if someone says to me, buy me a fridge, I'm going to laugh loud and then call the name of whoever is there. Mbuise, oh, I know. Mbuise knows what he has to do. He has to get the fridge. I can't say the fridge in public as a state president because everybody says, oh, what about me? What about me? But I must have the skill to respond to that guy because that guy met the president in his house. Something must give. <laughs> that president walked into my house. There must be a difference. What is this thing of going to Amman's Kral? You have no solutions, but you are going. To do what? <laughs> Because you know the problem. You are the president, minister, come here. What is the issue? Okay, which solution do you have? And then you, which budget can we redirect? Once you have worked that, you say, no, I've got a package. You go there. You don't announce you've got a package. You just go there and say, well, listen to people. Just stop there. Minister, do you hear what this guy is saying? Monday. I don't want Monday to end. There must be an advert for this tender immediately. Whatever you do, work for the eight. But I know that the tender is already being prepared. When I leave, people say, the president said this thing must happen on Monday. It's happening. Why do you act like you don't have information? You don't have access to information. You arrive there, you get shocked like everybody. <laughs> and then they say you are a president. Pella, the president is the executive. Our position of president in South Africa is the executive. These things of minister this, minister that, is fancy ways. The real titles for those guys is assistance of the president on education, on finance, on defense, on police. They are assisting him. If you don't do your work and it's not if he can take that guy, defense and put it in his office. No one will question him. You can make the noise you want to make. There's a problem here. I want to solve it. The same way he went to fetch uh, intelligence and put intelligence in his office but there is a crisis of intelligence. It's not true. He brought intelligence in his office because, not even to listen to us, Shem. Cyril, one, even if he listens to us, what will he do? There's nothing he can do. He doesn't take any action. He brought the intelligence into his office because of the slash fund. There is m too much money, too much money in the intelligence. Now your president was caught with dollars. You don't ask the question, where did he get the dollars? Slash funds include all foreign currencies. All currency you can think of. There are pounds there. You remember the story when they said they broke into the SSA offices, they took the foreign currency money. From, so, boom, your president is found with dollars. Where did the guy get the dollars? But this guy sits in his office with slash fund. No one can audit those people. When you enter, first thing, that thing I said they will do with a, a Veti. Here is kids from Auditor General's office. Auditors. Well, because it's not the Auditor General who audits. She's got her own staff. But no, these kids are not vetted, these ones. Now, how do they go and check the finances of the intelligence when they are not vetted? Okay, vet them. It's them who must vet you. Like they did with Mbuizen. They vetted him and asked him all kinds of questions because he sits in the uh, intelligence committee. Till today, they didn't give you a certificate. Did they give you that thing? Yeah, <laughs> but he was subjected to lie detect. <laughs> and then he was asked of a... Uh, some deposit, some high school sweetheart deposited into his account. Who's this one? And then he forgot. He, he, he said, what's the name? Why well, who's this one? All manner of harassment. And then they withhold that thing, vetting certificate. They don't issue it. They say, no, 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 we're coming, we're coming. That's it. In the military, intelligence is worse. Money gets used the way the Speaker of Parliament was using it when she was there. You can't do anything. Those generals, 
in the army, they don't play with anyone, including politicians. They look at you and tell you that thing's not going to happen, what you are trying to do. <laughs> you were here and you were told the army went to buy vaccine in, a, a, in Cuba. Yeah, they didn't follow the process. Yeah, the Cuban vaccine is not pa didn't pass South Africa's test. What, what, what? It must go back. They went there, they told them, where is it going? It's not going anywhere. <laughs> These ones are going to be vaccinated with Cuban uh, vaccine. They were vaccinated with that uh, vaccine of Cuba. No one could do anything. They just tell you, what are you talking about? When? Who are you? Yeah, it's done. That's how powerful the state is. And this guy is abusing that office for that purpose. Expropriation of land without compensation is going to be the first agenda in the negotiations for coalitions. We are not far apart with the ANC on expropriation of land without compensation because at the core of the foundation of the ANC 1912, it was the land. The occupation of South Africa was followed by wars of dispossession. And people were fighting over the land. And the kings came together and educated men and said, we need to come together and reclaim our land in an organized manner. And that's when the ANC was formed. So everything else we are saying here in the EFF is the original demands of the revolution. Not these artificial things that we're speaking about. At the core was the land. Then they took cattle. The cattle at that time represented the wealth of the country because there was no discovery of diamond and gold and all of those things at the time. So when we say we demand the return of the land and the wealth of the country, we're demanding even those cattle. But today, because... Uh, the economy is different. We're saying the minerals and natural resources must come back into the hands of the... So Mutsaikha is not... I was with Mutsaikha in that committee. We were aligned. That's why it, when Terra tried to take chances with one speaker, I almost forgot him. What are you doing now? Because the ANC and the EFF were this on the expropriation of land without compensation. So... For whatever reason, because it looks like, Prof, there is something that these guys have signed or agreed to in Codessa, which they are not telling us about. Because they know, there is, they know what needs to be done. When they are about to do what is to be done, they, or they remind them of the minutes or something, or remember? <laughs> <laughs> because Tandi Mudise, when she became the Speaker of Parliament, the first thing we're singing the same song with her is the relocation of parliament to Pretoria. She was advocating for that. We were together as the EFF will turn. Uh, arrival, when she was arriving. It didn't take Buma three months. Tandi was saying something else. <laughs> so what, what did they, we can't say they bought her. Yeah? They just something they went... Because those things were negotiated settlements. So they have to be loyal to the decisions they did. SADEC's deployment to DRC, there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, Africans must learn to deploy to help each other, not against each other. And it should not be done at the detriment of our own children who are not properly trained. Our army prof is not properly trained. It has got no capacity. It has got no resources. There was a fire that took place in an army base in Northern Cape and killed soldiers, made their souls rest in peace. That fire was not started by the enemy or by anyone. Fire starts now because those things are farms. As farmers, we know that fire can, we are always ready for fire. When the fire starts, in the military base, there is, there is no fire truck. There is no fire extinguisher. You're dealing with fire. Military means fire. That's why they talk fire by fire. If anyone attacks that thing, how are you going to extinguish the fire?
Then they go, boom. You know, every building you go to, you find some red things hanging here. Fire extinguishers there is here. That thing. They go fetch those things to try and extinguish the fire. That thing has expired. <laughs> it doesn't release anything. Why? There is no service in the military. So now what happens? They have to cut the trees and try to stop the fire with branches of the trees. That's how those comrades died. And then after they couldn't fight a fire that was not started by the enemy, or no, come here, go and find re rebels in DRC. Oh. They don't even have, uh, uh, you know, uh, those things, those fighter jets. Don't have helicopters. I was told there were helicopters which were sent to DRC. I think they were stuck there because they are not service. So you are fighting rebels who don't have the airspace, who can't fight from the air. You've got that capacity, you don't use it because you have undermined that capacity. So deploying in Africa must be natural. We need to look after each other. We need to support one another but it must not be at the risk of our own people. Here in South Africa, we've got a task force. In the police, it's called special task force. In the army, it's called task force. Highly trained, highly capacitated. Those are the people you send to DRC to go and fight rebels. But are they rebels there, or there is just some uh, tribalistic Battle that is taking place, then someone doesn't want us to know about it, and then they say they are rebels. Where people are told on their own original land, no, you must go to Rwanda. No, you, do. they don't, you don't speak the same language with us. Therefore, because you speak that Rwandan language, you must go back there. This is not your country. And then you fight people there. Why? Because they are mineral resources there. You don't want them to benefit from those mineral resources, on the basis of language, <coughs> on the basis of the fence. So we will not support uh, that uh, DRC wants to you know, uh, sponsor a certain sanctions against Rwanda. We think that uh, the two countries can still find an amicable solution to whatever animosities that exist in between them. The African solution can be found. People should just drop their egos and engage with each other. And SADC and the African Union must decisively intervene in DRC and in Sudan. Because what is happening in Sudan is unacceptable. People have been killed there for so many years. We're not saying anything about it. We're not saying anything about it. So where is the African Union to stop that nonsense which is happening in Sudan? Uh, so um, for, I think we, we, we promised 4 million jobs. And then we break them down. So we don't write them as 4 million jobs. So. We say, in this industry, we're going to create so many jobs. In this industry, we're going to create so many. This is how we're going to create them. Then combined, you realize we can create uh, uh, 4 million jobs in five years. Uh, so, you know, in the, in the securities alone, if we insource securities, we can create 170,000 plus jobs in South Africa. Why do you need a middleman to pay this guy of the security? This is the guy we know. We don't know the middleman. This is the guy we interact with every day. We can see what he's going through, but we can't make any means to intervene in his life. We need to hire these securities directly as government. If needs be, we can even establish a government security company and then pay them. When we insource them in Joburg, they were paid 3,500 per security, and government was charged 15,000 per security. Those of you who come from rural areas will know that when our grandfathers and fathers retired from work 
in Joburg and came back home, they came empty-handed. Why? They were security guards for 30 years at the gate of the municipality. 30 years. Every three years, a company changes hands from this company to this company. This company, he has never been under one company. He's got no pension. He's got no leave days. He's got no benefits. He's got no job security. The day he does what Naledi Chura did, he comes back the following day, someone is on that position. And you, you can't tell them anything. Little guy, you, you are not here. No, but I went to hospital, I was sick. Hey, wait. No, I was, my child, wait. They've got nothing. They can't say anything. They have to report 24-7. That's why they work at night. During the day, they try to meet their family obligations. When they come back to work, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, already the security guard is sleeping. There are no leave days. They can't rest. So we can create a lot of jobs in those uh, sectors. Uh, graduate grants. There are not so many graduates, by the way. There are very few. Um, how many? Um, less than 7% of the population. And in that less than 7% of the population, I think we constitute less than 7% yeah, as Africans. 7% graduates of the country. Um, no, 7% of the population graduates with degrees. Of that 7%, 7% are Africans. And majority of those people, by the way, they are employed. So there are very few. No, you can't do that. You can't say, uh, create doubt because what I'm saying, as a scholar, you can go and find it. It's, the, it's an readily available information that majority of our graduates are working. Um, I, I can't even account for no less than 85% of the graduates who are working. So graduation and work is there. It's very few, and those who are not working, because 7% uh, is us, and the majority of them are white graduates. If they don't work, they've got some form of income. So you can ask a question. Someone was telling me about PhD day. You can actually write a thesis on um, how many graduates receive 350 from government. Because that 350 from government says you must not have any form of income. There's no white person like that. There's no, there's no white person without any form of income. So in that 7% of unemployed people, who must now be given a, a stipend. You, whites are already out. <laughs> We're left with this 7% of Africans. That 7%, 85% to 90% of it is at work. And it's not just a graduate stipend. You have to demonstrate that you have been seeking job. You have been going to interviews, you have been put in this, because the EFF government is going to create a database of graduates. You can't say to me, we can't find chefs. What do you mean? Where, where are you looking for them? Here's a database of this government. That Department of Tulas English of Employment is supposed to have a graduate list, not even from you. Every university holds graduate ceremony. The list is there. Bring the list, bring the list, upload it there, qualification, all of that. People must go there to look for whoever they are looking for. The same, we are going to create another database of rapists. <laughs> Everyone who's convicted of rape must be in the public database. Yes. And that information must be accessible because those are murderers. Yes. So, all of us seated here, when someone says, I'm Julius Malema, you don't even make noise. You just punch his name on Google. <laughs> right? And then it comes rapist. <laughs> Done. 
Thank you. Because Thank you. these people go and rape our people, go to prison, come back, relocate to Northern Cape, to Eastern Cape. No one knows that person. They employ that person to be a teacher of a primary school and look after a girl child. You entrust a girl child with a rapist because information is not accessible. Why is this government that says it's fighting GBV, is fighting rape, is fighting murder, those convicted of murder and rape and dangerous crimes should be known to society? Because we need to know uh, who's who. So, uh, Vets University, SRC, uh, we, we, please, uh, we are happy with the support and we want you to stay true to what you promise the students. There's a big problem here uh, at Vets of Accommodation, uh, which the SRC is seized with that matter and leading from the front. I remember they even came to us and said, we must give them money to go and pay some of this accommodation uh, for the students. And we're looking at each other with them. We're saying, like, what are we going to do now? <laughs> uh, because we're not Patrice Mutsip. But once... Uh, <laughs> Once free education is given, a lot of problems will be resolved. I've got a problem, Prof, with NSFAS. Big problem with NSFAS. Now, I'm a member of parliament, a businessman in his own right. I've got a child. Next year is coming to university adverts, right? I'm going to pay the university for his fees. All the students that EFF take to school, pay university directly the fees. We all pay university directly. Here is a poor child who said government is going to pay for me. Why is government not paying the university directly like a private parents who pay the university directly? Why NSFAS, if it has got some unique role to play, why are the private parents who are paying not being told to pay to NSFAS, NSFAS will pay for them. Government pays to NSFAS. NSFAS pays to university. Why? We don't need NSFAS. We must cancel NSFAS and pay vets directly. We've got 20 children who are paid for by government. They are 20. Each one of them, we must pay 100 rand for them. It's 2,000 rand. We paid directly to vets. Without this corrupt middleman who finances the Communist Party programs because he works with Blade, they fire the corrupt one, they bring the same person through a back door in a different name. But when you look at the activity, it's the same. So we don't need NSFAS. Institutions of higher learning, they are a state department. So when a budget of Department of Health is passed, they don't pay some health agency to pay Department of Health. From finance, it goes straight to the Department of Health. From finance, it must go straight to the Department of Vets. That's a government department. And you can't tell me that all of these universities are inherently corrupt. These guys are presiding over huge amounts of money in reserves. Huge. Especially, Especially the, the former white institutions. So why would they not handle that annual fee you are paying them? So let's give the money directly to the students, I mean to the universities. And the universities must be the one that pay you. You are their student. They must be able to say, no, there is this allowance for this, for that, which is due to you. They pay you. You've got... You know who you are dealing with, student affairs. You know this guy. Not a call-free hotline. <laughs> it's your problem accommodation, press one. It's your problem. No, 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 no. We need a human interface with that. Fiscal currency, we'll have a discussion about that one day. Um, uh, we, 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 we were observing the world as it evolves, including the de-dollarization of the, the world and the digital currency. But uh, the fiscal policy of the EFF is very simple. We want a reserve bank 
that will be biased towards industrialization, not financialization. Because the Reserve Bank as is now is more leaning into financial institutions and does everything in its power to protect the interest of finance. The banks in South Africa are declaring huge amounts of profits per annum. They give you a bond at 5% interest rate and don't do anything after that. They just sit back. The Reserve Bank does job for them. Increase the repo rate. Increase the repo rate. Now it's sitting at 8.5. You bought at 5%. You pay more and the banks make more without doing nothing. They don't have to go produce anything. Or, uh -uh, as long as you took their loan, the governor will, will do the job for them. So we have no problem with that. But we want the Reserve Bank to borrow at an affordable rate so that we are not overcharged by the banks. And any program that comes as a result of uh, industrialization by financial institution that says, well, we're looking for this uh, kind of money because the agenda is to finance this industrialization thing. It must be easy for that to be financed through the support of the Reserve Bank. The same thing now, when we say, when they say change to geysers, no, solar, any application now that is made of installing solar and uh, moving from uh, uh, ESCOM to solar, the banks want that kind of transaction. They are supporting that we must shift to solar. The banks, are, uh, with ease, they finance it. Why are, is the Reserve Bank not saying to them, where is your transformative agenda as a bank? Where is your... Uh, uh, policy on financing industrialization so that we revive the manufacturing industry of this country because only manufacturing will grow the economy. And when, they grow, when the economy grows, jobs are created. No Zimbabwe takes a job from you. The economy is stuck. And the economy can produce jobs when it's stuck. What does it mean? Tomorrow, I can get Gate and McKenzie, we take the bus and take all these Zimbabweans and Lesotho and Nigerians away, take them home. There will still not be jobs because the economy is stuck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I think this is, this is an excellent note on which uh, to draw the curtain on this session. And I believe it has been an engaging day uh, for those who were here earlier on to listen to the representative of DA. And uh, just now, uh, a two hour, two and a half hour marathon uh, <laughs> with the president of the, of the EFF. Um, the uh, dialogue will continue uh, next Thursday, as indicated by the head of school. Uh, we will be having other political parties. Mm -hmm. And without doubt, uh, President, there will be some responses Absolutely. to the uh, various points which you have covered here. And there's an open space for conversation. We're, we are in a boxing match. Absolutely. So when the box <laughs> beg, you can't. As long as there's nothing personal, as long as you don't lie about other people, yeah. Let's keep the ball rolling. Absolutely. And we really appreciate this platform yeah, where we welcome. can em engage you know, honestly and openly without any hesitation. I yeah. really appreciate it. You're most Thank welcome, you. President. And ladies and gentlemen, the President of the EFM. Thank you.